everyone, and welcome to this month's live event for National Culture Circle. We're actually in Minnesota at their headquarters, and we actually get to do this live event in person, sitting at the same table, which is kind of awesome. So, of course, we have Toby Lishko back here with us. So, thanks for being here, Toby. Oh, I think it's great that we get to do it in person. Absolutely. This makes it so much easier to do. So, of course, uh, a lot of you know that we have a challenge going on right now. And so, we want to, first off, talk a little bit about the challenge and kind of show you how to get to some of the information um, on the challenge, because that's a question that we're getting a lot. Um, so when you go to the website or you go to the Facebook page to sign up and you get to the page that we're going to show you here where you actually get to enter in your email address, you're going to do that right here. So you can see I've entered in mine. And then you're just going to click join for free. And so that's going to take you to a split screen page. So this is sort of where I think some people are getting a little mixed up on where you need to go next. But over here, so you've officially joined the challenge and it tells you what your next steps are. So the next step is actually you can join the Facebook Facebook group page. This is a Facebook group page specifically for the challenge. Uh, you can post pictures, see pictures of other quilts that uh, people are making, the blocks. It's a really uh, fun way to interact with everybody doing the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing you can do is download the fabric requirements. So you can actually click here to download uh, the fabric requirements. And so that is uh, the first thing you're going to need to know uh, in terms of making this quilt is how much fabric you're going to need. So you can download that there. The other half of the screen, so everything over here, this is just an awesome uh, deal that you can take advantage of if you want to. The challenge is free. We just like to offer this to you in addition. So just know that that is uh, something that you can take advantage of, but that you don't have to do that. So that's all you need to do to uh, join the challenge is enter in your email, uh, join the Facebook group page, and of course, download the fabric requirements. So I want to uh, tell you that if you have questions to uh, ask for Toby to go ahead and enter those in, but I want to get to one of the first questions here first, because while we still have this computer here, a lot of you were asking where you can see finished pictures of both of the color options of the quilts. So that is on this page here. So this is actually nationalquiltercircle.com slash article slash fabric requirements. And you can see both of the color versions. So on the right hand side is the one that Toby has done. On the left hand side is the one that I have done with some optional applique. So that's where you can see both of them right next to each other. Decide what fabrics you want to use, what colors you want to use, and decide whether or not you want to do uh, any of the applique. So now that we have that out of the way, now we can get to answering all of your quilting questions that you have. And so our first one, this one comes in uh, from Dorothy and she wants to know, do you prefer templates or cutting your own? Well, um, I'm, uh, sometimes they call me the template queen because I do love making my own templates. Um, I think it's, uh, when you're using templates, they're more accurate. And um, so I have a lot of acrylic templates. But if I do a pattern where I don't have an acrylic template, I do, I will make my own with a heavy template plastic. Um, and it does make the piecing a little more accurate, especially when you have little corners cut off. And, uh, but if I'm just doing squares or trying rectangles or something like that, I will cut, I will cut my own fabric pieces. When you're making your own templates out of that template plastic, as I know a lot of people talk about uh, not wanting to cut through paper and things with a rotary cutter because it mm -hmm. dulls their mm -hmm. rotary cutter. Do you have a special rotary cutter for cutting out your template plastic? Do you use scissors? What do you do? I use a heavy duty scissors because they it works better with the scissors and I just I um, tape the uh, paper template on the back of my template plastic and then I cut around on the lines and that way I don't have to trace. I'm getting a real accurate template. So that's what I do. Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Gail and she wants to know if we've ever tried using Mod Podge fabric glue or another kind of glue or plaster to attach the fabric applique. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you can use a glue, but you don't want to use, I don't know what even Mod Podge is made of. What what's it, it, it's like a glue but like a coating at the same time. Oh, and it dries okay. really really stiff. So I, oh, okay. I would not recommend. No, I wouldn't either. recommend it. But the best thing to use for if you want to glue your fabric is uh, Elmer's glue glue because it's washable, it's uh, non toxic, and it comes right out once you uh, wash it. So uh, you can use like it on a stick, Elmer's glue on a stick, and um, you can just wipe it on the back of the fabric you're you're using and stick it to the your main fabric and then uh, quilt around it and then when you wash it it's gone. Yes, I can't think of the brand right now and you might be able to help me out <laughs> with this but it's a glue pen 
generally for English paper piecing. And it's a little pen, it's got a pink cap in it, and you can like twist it up. It's like a glue stick, but it's just a much finer uh, or smaller circumference, I guess, so you're putting less glue on your fabric at, at a time. Well, you can buy special glue tips for a glue oh, bottle, yeah. okay. and you can get these little micro tips that you can buy, and they just fit on the top of your regular glue bottle, and it only you can get a where you get one little dot that comes yeah. out at a time. Perfect. Do you ever pin your appliques? Uh, I don't do a whole lot of applique, but uh, occasionally, if it's a big piece, I'll pin it. But normally, I use I can I use freezer paper sometimes, and mm -hmm. so I iron it. I put the freezer paper shiny side <clears throat> towards the fabric, and so then I can iron it onto the fabric, and then I can tear it out when I'm done. Mm -hmm. I only ask because I actually use the little teeny tiny applique pins, which mm -hmm. is the only time I've ever used a non. Uh, extra fine silk pin, but they make little tiny uh, short little pins that are meant for applique that make it so you don't have as much pin sticking out all over your mm -hmm. your work. So applique pins work too. All right, Judy wants to know how do you square up a block? Well, um, there's a couple ways. Uh, one way is after you get the block done, if it's if it's pretty square, you really don't have to square it up. I mean, if you're using an accurate seam allowance and um, everything works out right, I, I don't take the time to square up my block. If it ends up being a little small, uh, sometimes I'll really uh, spray it well with water and then I'll take an iron and I'll try and iron it so that it makes stretches just a little bit. Um, you, if it's too big, you can use a ruler, a square ruler and square it down. The only problem with that is if you square it too much, you might lose some points that you have on your block. So I don't tend to square up my blocks unless it's really, uh, unless maybe it's a log cabin or you're not going to notice it that much. Uh, but otherwise, I try and instead of squaring up the block, I'll just kind of ease it into the rest of my quilt and, um, and make it work. How about you? Um, sim something similar, and I think you've mentioned this even on some of your patterns, and it's written in there, you sort of use a measure-as-you-go technique, mm -hmm. so if someone's never heard of that term, like what does that mean, and how do you um, make your blocks work if they're oh, not the right size? Okay. Well, if you use a measure-as-you-go, if you're doing small sections within a larger block, like if you're doing flying geese or half-square triangles, quarter-square triangles, and it tells you the measurement that that individual piece is, then what you're going to do is you're going to measure that piece. If it's not the right size, you'll, you'll make it the right size. You'll square it down to that size. And then by the time you get your full block done, it should be the right size because you've measured those indi individual pieces. And once you put all those individual pieces that are the right size together, then everything else is going to be the right size. If you wait till the end of your block, at the end of your block when it's done, and you try and square it up then or try and make adjustments, then it's going to be too late. Yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of making adjustments, though, because I know you and I have both seen a bunch of pictures on that Facebook group page that you should probably join if you're part of the challenge that's going on now, um, is that people have added additional sashing strips around mm -hmm. certain pieces to make something bigger. So if you were needing to make something bigger, where would you add in a sashing strip and how would you do it? Well, I did see those. There was two of them that mm -hmm. said that their, uh, that center block, which is set on point, was too small to put the larger triangles around it. Mm -hmm. So that was great that they decided, oh, I'm going to put their, it's actually, there's another word for it. It's called, um, um, now I just forgot what that word is called, <laughs> uh, coping. That is, is to make it a little bigger than you need it to be, and then you can always cut it down to size. Because yeah. if you try and just add a quarter of an inch extra and cut a three quarters an inch strip, it might be too small still. So what I would do is I would cut an inch or an inch and a half strip, sew it around that block, and then cut it down to size. It makes it a lot easier to square off that way. Perfect. Well, speaking of uh, the center block being on point, that kind of goes into our next question here. Um, Gwen kind of has a two-part question, but the first part is she is looking to learn methods for turning a block on point. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know what a method to turn it on point is, but um, your quilting patterns usually say that the pattern is on point or it's a straight setting. On point just means you, you've got your block instead of a square block. It looks like a diamond. And then you have to determine uh, what your half square, your quarter square triangles are going to be on the outside of it to set it. Um, if it's on the outside edge or corner, um, then you would take your finished size of your block, say your block's a 10-inch block, and to cut that 
a half square triangle to fit on the corner, you would add and uh, well, you could always add a little extra. It's uh, actually you add a seven eighths of an inch to that finished square, so it would be a ten and seven eighths inch square, and then you cut it into two half square triangles. But I have a tendency to cut them a little bigger, so I would cut cut it at an eleven inch square and cut it in half, and then I can always square my block down to the size I need it to be. If it's a half square triangle, I mean a quarter square triangle that would go on the inside of the block, then you add an inch and a quarter to your finished measurement. So if your finished block is 10 inches, if you add an inch and a quarter, you would cut a, an 11 in, and th a quarter inch square and then cut it twice to get the quarter square triangles. And that's what would you, you would use in the center of a quilt if you were to put it in the, on point that way. Yes, and um, if you're someone who is, is listening to all that and is not sure what a half square triangle is or a quarter square triangle or any of that setting triangles, you actually did a video for us, which should be available on the site soon if it's not already up there now, where you actually explain the difference between half square triangles, quarter square triangles, and sort of explain the main difference and why you use one one place versus the other. So check that one out. Right, and another thing is, is a lot, we got a lot of questions um, in the beginning of the challenge as to what a Q QST and uh, HST. HST were. I have to think about it in my brain, and um, and uh, I always explain. I, whenever I write a pattern, I always have kind of an introduction, you mm -hmm. know, and so it tells you what all the terms are that you will see in the in the quilt pattern. Mm -hmm. So you should always, and I know a lot of us are guilty of just kind of skipping through everything and just wanting to get to the project, but um, you should always read a pattern all the way through before you start it, just because a lot of times you'll get to something you might not understand, and it might be explained in the beginning of the pattern. So it's real important to just kind of look through the pattern, look through the beginning instructions to see if there's any terms that you might come up against that you didn't know about. Yes, absolutely. And I think the only other abbreviation you might use, do you, do you abbreviate flying geese unit? I do, but I don't one. think we have any in this quilt. Well, never I think mind. <laughs> anyway, everybody okay. was complaining. I had too many in the last one, so uh, the first no more one. So geese. we don't okay. have flying geese in this one, I don't think. All right. Well, so the <laughs> second half of Gwen's question, she wants to know if there's a good way to to add a color to really make a block pop. Uh, that is an excellent question. And what I usually do, uh, sometimes if you just add black, it really makes a quilt pop. But um, I like to stick a bright fabric in uh, a lot of my quilts just to make uh, make it just a little more interesting. And you just have to look through the colors that you're using, uh, whether you're taking your colors from your border print or you're taking it from a main print, and just pick out the brightest color that's in that fabric. It doesn't have to be the same shade. Shade just means light to dark. Um, it, it can be it can be just brighter, and I don't know how to explain the word brighter. Can you explain <laughs> the word brighter? Whether it pops or not. Um, just thinking about things that are bright, like when you look at them, oh, the sun. When you look at the sun, you're like, oh my gosh, it's bright. Like, I think of a color that when you look at it, you're really, you know, it's bright. So yeah. I think you, it, you may not be able to describe it, but you'll know it when you see it. It's one of those. Well, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. All right, our next one here, um, Beth would like to know, how do I determine what kind of quilt batting to use with different projects? Um, let's see. Um, I have a tendency to use the same batting with most of my projects. Now, they do make a special batting for baby quilts. It's fireproof, fire retardant. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would probably recommend using one of those if you're making a baby quilt. But... Um, other than that, I, I have a favorite batting that I like to use for almost all of my quilts. And, um, and I, unless I'm going to do a, a miniature quilt or a small quilt that, that might be hand, hand quilted, um, wool is a really good batting for hand quilting. Um, if it's going on a long arm, it really doesn't make any difference what kind of batting you use because a long arm machine can quilt through any, anything. <laughs> um, but um, it's just a matter of personal preference, what, what kind of width you like, whether you want it 100% cotton, whether you want it to be a blend or com uh, completely polyester. The polyester battings today aren't anything like the polyester battings that came out when I first um, the the polyester battings today are very soft, just like cotton batting. So 
Um, you just have to find which batting you like best, and sometimes you can touch samples in your local quilt shop or um, some of the other shops that carry battings and see which one you like feels better. Some of them wrinkle more than others when they're folded a lot and some don't. So uh, you just kind of have to experiment with all the different kinds of battings you can get. Yeah, and a lot of too will come down to what you want your, because your, you can feel the batting, you know, obviously in the store, but then it's going to be in between the layers of your quilt, so you're not going to feel it when mm -hmm. it's on your quilt. But think of how it's going, is it, uh, really nice and does it drape easily? Is it going to look good on your bed? Is it going to be breathable? So those are some, some of the things you want to think about too if you are in a very hot environment. Maybe you want a really lightweight like silk or bamboo, something very breathable right. batting right. versus right. wool, you know. Well like actually that. wool batting is not heavy. Really? Yeah. I always think of wool as like wool sweaters keep you nice and warm. Yeah. Yeah, so but wool is it's a natural fiber, so it does breathe, and okay. you don't. It's yep. not. They're actually the hottest batting would be polyester because it doesn't right. breathe, and so it, you don't have a whole lot of things, uh, air or whatever it is that goes through ventilation. It. Ventilation. There we go. That's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Next one here. Uh, Susan Ann says, "I am making a farm scene quilt with many animals, a garden, barns, etc., that all stick out. How would you recommend that I quilt it?" So think, hmm. how would you quilt something with a lot of intricate appliques? Um, that would probably be your I, I didn't. Expertise. I didn't quilt my quilt that has the appliques <laughs> on it, or I would answer that one, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't do a whole lot of applique, but when I've done it, I usually just do echo quilting around it, or I'll do a grid work, you know, um, mm -hmm. around it. Um, sometimes you can do these, what's called a, um, what is it, spiral? Not spiral. It Where you... you come from the center and goes out. Mm -hmm. um, raise, maybe that's what it's called, mm -hmm. raise. Um, so there's all kinds of things. I don't put a whole lot of quilting within the applique itself unless it's a pretty big piece of applique. Okay. Every batting has requirements as to how far apart you have to do the quilting. Right. So if you use a batting that you, have, you can quilt eight inches apart and it still holds together, then you don't have to put a whole lot of quilting in it. Mm -hmm. But I will tend to do some, if it's a big piece, I'll tend to do some echo quilting or just kind of quilting around the edge. Uh, I, if it's a leaf, I might put a leaf design inside the leaf. Uh, so you just have to, uh, when I'm quilting something, I look at the quilt design, it's the quilt or the design or the fabric, and that gives me an idea of how to quilt it. So sometimes, you know, just kind of looking at your quilt and kind of thinking about how, see, I'd say quilts talk to me, which sounds really I strange. I was just going to say that. The, the <laughs> friend that does my, my, some of my quilts for me, she always says, I, I, might, I might send her one and say, it has flowers on it. Can you quilt flowers? And she's like, well, I'll talk to the quilt and let you know. Like, it will, it will tell me how it needs to be quilted. Yeah, they do. I mean, so I look at the quilt, and it kind of gives me an idea how I'm supposed to quilt it. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes if you look at your quilt, it, it may talk to you and tell you how it needs to be quilted. I mean, that sounds like it's crazy, <laughs> but it's not really. <laughs> okay. Only quilters understand that. Yes, we'll get it. All right, our next one here. Um, I have bought batting online and it comes rolled up in a bag. Is there a good way of getting the big creases out so that it will lay flat in my quilt sandwich? Yes, the best thing to do is put it in a dryer and at, put it on air setting, just mm -hmm. air setting, uh, or the lowest setting you have, and just tumble it for about 10 minutes and it should take all those wrinkles out of it. So I've always ever just pressed it. I mean, I guess it's a really big, I've never had a really big long wrinkle, but can you just iron your batting just like you would fabric? Well, I guess you could. Um, I've just never ironed batting. I mean, it just... Uh, Throwing new things out at you, seeing yeah. if they're possible. <laughs> I, I guess you could if it's not too big of a, a crease, but if, if you've got a 90-inch wide batting, it'd be hard to take all those creases out. That's if true. it's a big, you know, king-size batting or queen-size batting, the easiest thing to do is just to throw it, unfold it, and then just throw it in the dryer for about 10 minutes. Perfect. All right, our next question here from Toba. What is the best way to begin quilting? I know the very basics of sewing, though to be honest, I have issues with straight lines. Oh. Well, if you know how to sew and you've sewed a seam, then you can sew basically a straight line. I mean, a lot of clothing have straight lines on them. So the only thing, uh, if you want to get into quilting, is to learn how to get that accurate quarter inch. Once you get that quarter inch down, um, you can make almost anything because everything has the has that quarter inch in it and you learn how to cut shapes and put those shapes together. Find a pattern that's a pretty easy pattern to start with. Uh, something with just rectangles or squares 
and um, and then do that first, and then each time try something a little harder. Take a lesson from a quilt shop um, if you have a quilt shop in the area. Um, National Quilter Circle has YouTube has uh, videos that you can watch to learn how to do some quilting. So you know there's a lot of in information out there to help you learn how to quilt. Absolutely. All right, our next one here, Eric Boyle says, it's his first time quilting. I want to finish the top somehow. Is there a good way to practice the stippling pattern freehand? Any patterns to maybe trace or learn with, maybe sew over the top of? Well, there are some fabrics. Actually, there are some backings that have the stippling on them, and you can follow the little lines on the backing of the fabric. So you could try that. Um, you could play with uh, little squares of fabric in your machine. Uh, when I first started learning to quilt, I started with the little square and I just kept moving it around until I got something, well, what I wanted. But it does take some practice. Um, I call it doodling. With my long arm, I can doodle all I want. I can do an a doodle an alphabet. I can doodle anything. I had my grandkids doodling on my long arm quilt. So. Um, quilting machine. So it's just a matter of practice and getting in, into a movement where you can do it. But I would start with something simple. You can do straight lines. You don't have to do stippling, um, which is just meandering back and forth in a wiggy waggy way. <laughs> That's a technical term right there. Mm -hmm. Wiggy waggy. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, you just have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, uh, Wenda wants to know, do you need to use the appliques in the quilt? And the quilt she's referring to is, of course, our challenge quilt that's going on right now. Um, but do you have to use the appliques? No, you have the option of using appliques if you want to do one uh, or two blocks with appliques. If you don't want to do any applique at all, you don't have to do the applique. You've got the option of doing either. I've seen some quilts. Uh, I saw one recently on uh, the Facebook page where they did their own little applique in the center. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're not confined to doing what we have you doing. I mean, I, we want you to be creative, do it in your own way. One lady did piece the center and then she put appliques in the mm -hmm. little corner. So, yeah. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It's your quilt. Be yeah. creative. Yeah, and just so you know that there is will be instructions for both. So, when you download the pattern, you can, you know, download block for piece instructions or download for applique instructions. So um, there will be instructions for both. So don't think that you have to just kind of make up your own uh, appliques. We'll provide you that. Or if you don't want to do that at all, you can follow the piece version as well. Yeah, the applique uh, patterns are in there. So you can mm -hmm. just copy those and print them out. Yes, or of course use your AccuQuilt. Mm -hmm. That's right, mm -hmm. you can use your AccuQuilt. Yes. All right, our next one here. I have made pinwheel blocks and the centers are perfect. The directions read to square the blocks. How do I know which side to remove the excess from? I'm trying to think of if this, you're saying the center is perfect, mm -hmm. but you're saying that the block is too big? Yes. Okay. Um, I would t shave a little bit off of each side because you don't want to lose, uh, you want to be able to get that quarter inch around the edge of that, and you don't want to lose those points of those, those uh, diagonals. So um, I would just shave a little bit off each edge until you get it to the right size. So it would be important when you're cutting to make sure that you still keep the seam between the two colors in the corners, right? Making right. sure it stays in the right. corner so you're not getting off square right. anyway. Right, right. Yeah. All right, our next one here, just finished a cross stitch quilt top. How do I quilt it without destroying the cross stitching? Well, actually, I have done one of those. Perfect, okay. I, I had a customer who gave me a cross stitch quilt, and I did not quilt. I, you don't quilt through the stitching because you, if you do, you might accidentally tear the stitching. So you just, uh, like what I call echo stitching, which is just outlining what the cross stitch is. Um, if, if it's a big area between the, where the outside of the cross stitching is and the inside, try and find a space where you can quilt in between some of the stuff, but I wouldn't quilt through the stitches at all. Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Marie, and she says, what is the challenge? Can you explain more? So we've talked a little bit about the challenge <coughs> at the very beginning, and Marie, I will say that once we finish the live event, you can go back and watch from the very beginning, um, and at the beginning is where we actually show you the page you can go to uh, to enter your email uh, to download the fabric requirements to join the challenge. So it is a quilt block challenge where over the next eight weeks, 
Uh, you'll get a different piece of the puzzle of this quilt uh, each week. We're starting with the center most block this week, and then next week we'll get more blocks and more blocks, and then assembly instructions, and then you'll have a finished quilt um, by the end of the challenge. And it is one where uh, Toby has designed the pattern with 100% uh, pieced option, and then I've just taken a couple of the blocks and added in some fun little optional appliques if you choose to use them. If you have an AccuQuilt, uh, who we worked with for this challenge, you can use that to not only cut out the pieces to piece the blocks, you can use those to cut out the shapes to applique, or you can just download the templates, trace them, and cut them out with scissors or rotary cutters and do that as well. So there's a bunch of options and this is actually uh, what both of the quilts look like. So the one on the right is the one that Toby did and the one on the left is my color scheme with some fun little appliques. So that is a, just a quick of what the challenge is, but of course once we're done, go back and watch those first couple minutes too if you wanna see me actually entering in an email and all that. So. The nice thing about the AccuQuilt is, is that the corners of like the triangles are all cut off, mm -hmm. so it makes everything match so much nicer. Yes. Plus, we've had a lot of people commenting on that Facebook group page that have the AccuQuilt that they really like using it because they either find they have issues with using a rotary cutter, they have hand issues, um, arthritis, things like that, and it's just a lot easier for them to use their AccuQuilt. So mm -hmm. it could be uh, something you want to invest in because of that as well. Right. So. And the thing that I had mentioned about using the AccuQuilt is, is when I write the written instructions for cutting the pieces, you have to cut them a certain size. But with the AccuQuilt, you have a square that's a die. So you have to cut your pieces according to what that die is. So if, if, you, if people who have AccuQuilts Acu understand that. So they're not going to follow the general cutting instructions that um, I put in there for regular cutting. Right. And if you're thinking of just going and buying an AccuQuilt, <clears throat> they will, it will also come with instructions and we can even do additional videos. Or of course AccuQuilt has some on their website of just here's how you use the AccuQuilt cutter mm -hmm. too. So perfect. All right. Our next one here. Um, what do you think of fusible batting? I have, have, I do not have a large area and aging knees don't want to kneel on the floor to baste it. Well, um, I have used fusible batting and, but I've only used them for small projects. They're very hard to iron on if you're doing it on a very big quilt. So, um, and you have to find a surface to be able to iron it on so that it lays flat. So I've done it for small wall quilts maybe a small lap quilt, but I, I have, I, it's hard to use it for anything bigger than that because it's just f hard to find an area to iron on to get it to lay nice and flat because you want, you're want you ironing one layer at a time. You're ironing the whole top on and then you're going to iron the whole back on. So um, it is hard to do if you're doing a, a large quilt. Mm -hmm. All right, our next one here, um, the question says, what is the best applique brand? Uh, someone was saying Pellon, it's very confusing. So that's not actually an applique brand, but can you explain Pellon, what that is? No, you, you no. do more applique, I'll <laughs> so, let you do that. <laughs> Pellon is just a brand of a fusible web, which is a double-sided fusible adhesive that you can use to stick your appliques on. Um, so we were talking in the, earlier in the beginning of different ways that you can hold your appliques in place using glue sticks, using... Um, you said freezer paper sometimes. Mm -hmm. So this, this is just a way that you can fuse the fusible web. It will come with a paper on one side, a glue on the other side. You'll fuse the glue to the wrong side of your fabric. Then you'll peel that paper off and then you can just fuse your shape right down onto the fabric that you want to applique in place. And it is a permanent adhesive. So it's not something that once you fuse that in place, that's where that applique goes from now on. Like you can't reposition it. So know that it is a permanent adhesive, but so that's what Pellon is. It's not actually the applique itself. It's just the, the way to secure the applique in place. And there's different weights. So if you're doing something that, you know, like uh, batiks or something lit real lightweight, you want to use a real lightweight um, fusible batting, uh, fusible um, material. But mm -hmm. some of the heavier stuff, like if you're doing uh, maybe a t-shirt quilt or something, you might want to use a little heavier fusible. So it just kind of depends on the project. And each fusible brand does tell you on the back of it what it's best used for. So just read that to try and figure out which one you need to use. Yep, and just to clarify real quick, because I know, so when you're mentioning t-shirt quilts, so you're thinking fusible interfacing, right? I always want to clarify oh, that yeah. there's a difference between interfacing and fusible web. So interfacing only has glue on one side and then it's got uh, like a fabric on the back so that's something that you use to stiffen something and mm -hmm. that's where you definitely want the, the different weights. Fusible web is a completely different pro product in that it's just a glue 
So you actually peel that off and then all you're left with is glue. So they're a little bit different. Um, so yeah, one's a fusible web and one's a fusible interfacing. So just oh. know that interfacing okay. stiffens, fusible web sticks. We'll go uh, with that. Well, there, <laughs> there is fusible um, interfacing that's fusible on both sides. Then that's fusible web. Oh, okay. Yep. I think so. Oh man, we're gonna have to. We'll tie some of them. We'll clarify all this. So read, many fusibles. We have to read up on that. Okay. All right. Our next question here. Um, so people are saying that they have joined the challenge, but only got the. Oh, only got the fabric choices, but no list of the vocabulary of quilting terms that you were talking about. So you can explain um, where that was, where you typed up what the half square triangles and quarter square triangles. Well, I thought it was on the same page. It's, you know, the fabric requirements are on the left, and then it goes into some diagrams on what a half square triangle is, what a quarter square triangle is. Uh, I think there's a chevron on that page too. And so all those um, terms are on that same page as the um, initial fabric requirements. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, there's an, a little one little extra page. I can't remember what's on the third. The swatches, where the you can swatches, actually that's um, right. cut out your, so it's like little blank squares and you can either color it in or you can cut out um, one of your fabrics and just tape it right there. So that way you can, you know, refer back to, okay, my fabric three is this. And just right, go real quick. right. Yeah, and this, it's really good to have that little guide for you because when you go on, move on to the, each step, it's going to tell you fabric one or fabric mm -hmm. two. And then all you have to do is look back at your guide and say, okay, this is where I need to use this fabric. Yeah. And speaking of that, since that is a question I've seen pop up a lot on the Facebook group page is people want to know um, what colors, what, what is your fabric number four? What is your fabric number one? And that is something that you have in the fabric requirements page. Um, you just have to, you have to do a little comparison. So like she'll say, I forget, I'm not going to get the numbers wrong here, but your well, fabric, say four fabric is, yeah, is pink is or what, white you know. or whatever, yeah. yeah. So, and then you have to just compare back and then you can figure out if you want your color placement to be exactly like Right, yours. right. Yeah. And so you can also look at the quilt to see where it's, where it is in the quilt so that you'll know when you choose your own fabrics, mm -hmm. you'll think about where it, where it is best. Now, you know, my light background is, um, my light background. So, you know, I mean, if you want a light background or a dark background, that's kind of an e one of the easier ones to mm -hmm. kind of figure out. But the rest of them, you have to think about the contrast and where you want to put those fabrics. Yes. And speaking of your background, because I've even got this question a couple times emailed to me, uh, your background is a tone on tone. So what is that? A tone on tone just means uh, if, if it uh, has, it might have a pattern in it. And the pattern would be, um, say it's a, Oh no, a wiggle or some kind of funny line or something in it, but that line is similar to the background color. So say it's a white on white, so it has a little white design, but it's embossed in white, so that's a tone on tone. Or it's a brown and it has tan lines through it, um, that's a tone, tone on tone. So it just gives you one tone of the fabric, which is uh, a different uh, color in the same family or it might be it's just something that blends in together so it's usually called a blender or tone on tone um, it's not a solid because a solid would be just one color but it just does have some little pattern on it and it might be a, a similar color to the main color in the fabric yes perfect all right our next one here uh, Rosanna says hello from Argentina as a new quilter what kind of quilt can I make first um, I always tell people the best quilt to make first, it's called a rail fence. And basically, it's, you're just sewing a whole bunch of strips together. It can be two or three or four strips together, and then you cut them into squares. So say you sew uh, four two and two and a half inch strips together, and that makes an eight and a half inch uh, set. Okay, I would cut them into eight and a half inch squares, and then you can rotate them and, and do different things with them. That's probably the easiest. If, if they're not all the same size, you can always trim them down to be the same size. You don't have to worry about matching seams, and that's probably one of the, that's, I think that's the very first quilt that I made. Uh, so that's, the, the, I think, the easiest one to make. Yeah, and if you want a visual of what a rail fence look like, looks like, we have something similar on the site. I don't think we call it a rail fence. Um, one of our other instructors just did a fun video on how you can put together, I'm going to call it a faux rail fence, uh, using some jelly rolls. So those are just two and a half inch strips of fabric. Obviously, you don't have to use those strips of fabric, but you can get an idea of how you just put those strips together and kind of measure and rearrange as you go. So that is a video that you can watch if you want a visual on the rail fence. Okay. 
Uh, Laura wants to know any idea uh, when all the fabrics will be sent out. So, oh, my, my, oh. Yeah, so just touch on that. Uh, we'll just okay. Talk about real quick. Now, I have done some kits uh, with some of the fabrics. And so uh, I did send out the main fabric that's used in the big quilt. I did send those fabrics out. Um, the only one that's uh, behind schedule is the batik group because I ran out of uh, the main fabric in there and I was able to find it. I emailed saying I wasn't able to find it, but I was able to find it. But since I'm out of town, I don't know if it's come in yet or not, but I know it had been shipped. So as soon as I get back in town, which will be on uh, tomorrow, um, on Thursday, I should be able to send out the rest of the kits and you should all have them uh, by the beginning of next week. So that's our fault. We stole you away so we could get some more <laughs> quilting content and quilting knowledge from you. All right, our next one here. I plan to make a Mickey Mouse quilt out of Mickey heads. I want to applique them on square fabric and what would be a good zigzag stitch width and length to use around all of the Mickey heads on the square fabric? Uh, so you want to, what you're saying is you want to machine applique these down. Is yes. that what she's saying? Yep. Okay. Um, you know, it's all a matter of per what you want it to look like. I mean, you could put it, put them close together. You can make it almost a satin stitch. You could, uh, you know, I mean, it, it just depends. What I usually do before, if I do machine applique, is I will take a test fabric, I'll take a little patch, and I'll play with the different size zigzags, whether I make it wider or thinner or, you know, further apart, closer together, and then I find which is the most pleasing look for me, and then, that, then, then I'll take that to the quilt. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, personally for me, I don't think I have ever zigzag stitched an applique down, just because, and if I were going to make the Mickey Mouse head quilt as well, just because I'm picturing Mickey Mouse and his nice curved head and all his curved ears, it's really hard to do a zigzag around a curve and make it look even because you're going to have little... V's on the inside, big V's on mm -hmm. the outside is just mm -hmm. not going to look as even as maybe you wanted to. So mm -hmm. I would recommend a blanket stitch for that. Like that mm -hmm. would be my go-to method. So if you're not liking the way the zigzag stitch is looking, uh, maybe try out an alternative uh, applique stitch as well. Okay. Or right. you could do a satin stitch. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're appliquing it down. It It'll cover it all. Yep, that's true. All right, our next question here. Bev says she's only seen the pieced block. When and where will she see the applique? So I have to refer you back to, you can't look at it. Well, maybe they can put it up again right now. I'm not sure. I'm going to test them right now. If they can put it up on the screen right now, then you'll be able to see the two quilts. There they are. If not, you can always see it back at the very beginning. Uh, once we finish the live, you can always go back and watch this again. So everything from the beginning, we've talked about how to access this page, how to sign up for the uh, live event, all that will be, or I'm sorry, sign up for the challenge, all that will be available. But here are both of the quilts. The right is the piece, the left is the one with the applique. So there are pictures of both of them for you right there. All right, our next question here, Joe says, I still need my medallion quilts quilted. Can you believe that? <laughs> still going to start this one though, so thank you. So speaking of the medallion ones, that was the one that you did previously since that is sort the of- The first one. Yes, mm -hmm. b before ice crystals. Yes. Um, that is sort of the style of how this one comes together too. Right. And I know a lot of people that first one was their, their first experience with a medallion quilt so can you kind of explain what that really is and how it comes together okay a medallion quilt is basically a quilt that starts with a center design it can be on point it can be straight um, but <clears throat> the the it works out from there it can be lots of different borders that go off of that so uh, you can do plain borders you can put blocked uh, piece blocks around it so just like the first one we have uh, we have that center unit, which is what you're working on right now, and then it'll work from there. So it may be a pieced border from there. It may be a, a single border. So um, you just have to kind of follow. And usually with a medallion quilt, you get your instructions on how to put it together all at the end. So you're piecing, you're learning to piece each individual part of that quilt, and then um, at the end you're going to put it all together. Now back to, we talked about measuring as you go. And I know this is a question I actually, uh, this is gonna be a two part question. So the first part is how, do, well, we've talked about squaring up your blocks and not wanting your blocks to be too small. Mm -hmm. But if they are too small, you can sort of measure as you go and fix if necessary. But in something like a medallion style, if you're putting all of your blocks together and your whole row is either too big or too small to fit onto that medallion, mm -hmm. how do you fix that when that's not necessarily as plain piece of fabric border, right. it's blocks that you can't really right. cut. And well, I mean, I always say when, after you finish your center piece, 
Um, of course, you want to measure it and make sure it's the measurement that the pattern calls for. Um, uh, once you start piecing those blocks, if you're sewing blocks around that centerpiece, um, what I do is I do measure as I go. So say I put two blocks together, and all of these blocks are 8-inch finished blocks. So I've put two blocks together, so now I should have 16 and a half inches. I put three blocks together, I should have 24 and a half inch, or 18 and a half inches, eight, 24 and a half inches. We're doing mental math here, <laughs> mental all right. Mental math, okay. So I do measure them for a while, and then if I know it's going okay, then I'll finish, go ahead and finish that whole border. Now, if it still doesn't end up being the right size, I have done this, where I've either taken uh, some of the uh, seams out and making them smaller, or I've made them a little bigger so that it fits. So you can make adjustments after you piece this whole border, as long as you either take seams out, you figure out whether it's too big or too small, and you can make adjustments that way by just uh, fixing your seams. If you do that, you have to make a little adjustment with each every other seam or a few seams, but you have to do it evenly across that border strip. So. Um, so like if mine was too big, I'd take in uh, maybe every other seam until I get to the right measurement. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, our next one here. Um, Terry says it's hot and humid in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, so batting is always a problem. I don't want it too thick and hot, but I still want the poof. So what should I use? Well, you're, if you're getting a th using a thin batting, uh, you're not going to get a poof. Uh, sometimes if you use a cotton, a thin cotton batting, some battings you can get um, di different thicknesses, like uh, Quilter's Dream, which is one that I like to use, comes in a polyester and a cotton and a cotton blend, and each one of those has different thicknesses, so they have a really thin version, which is, uh, of course, you're not going to get a poof from the thin version. You can use a thicker version of cotton if you wanted to, um, and... Um, but it's going to be a hotter quilt, so um, the thicker thicker it gets. So uh, you just have to kind of think of, of how heavy you want that quilt to be in the summer, and you just choose a thinner quilt, uh, cotton batting, and you'll just have to give up your poof. Sometimes if it's 100% cotton, if you wash it, it makes a little poof because it kind of draws crinkles it. It, it yeah. crinkles it yeah. a little bit, mm -hmm. so it just it makes it look like it's aged. Yeah, sometimes they call that the rumpled look. It has like the right. rumpled look. Yeah, right. I like it. All right, our next one here, um, Sharon says, how do you decide on colors for your quilt and how do you decide on large or small prints? Well, that's a very good question. I did make a, on the Facebook page, I did give a really good explanation of how to pick fabrics. One is, if find a fabric you really like at the quilt shop. And um, it doesn't have to be in, if you, don't, if you don't want to use it in the quilt, you don't have to use it in the quilt. Just because you like a fabric doesn't mean you have to use it. But somebody spent a lot of time putting all those colors together. So you know all those colors are going to work. So what I usually tell people is you want to, uh, when I first learned to quilt, uh, I was taught to use a light, a medium, and a dark. Okay, so I was able to pick three different fabrics. Um, but you not only want to use a light, medium, and a dark, you want to use some in between. So you have to think about where is this quilt going to be used. So if it's going to be used in a border or in some of those bigger corner corners, uh, you want to use a bigger print. If it's going to be in small pieces, you want to use, like I said, a tone on tone, a blender. You can use solids in those small pieces and, or a smaller print. So you just have to look at the quilt to see where those prints are going to go, and that'll help you determine what, what size prints you're going to use and what colors you want to put together. Yep, absolutely. I totally agree with um, using, like I said, using something to pick your colors or uh, especially on this windmills and pinwheels pattern like I picked my main print which you picked a main print I picked a main print and then I used all solids which are all solid colors from within that main print fabric or as close to as I could find so that that was sort of my my inspiration for it. and I usually only pick one print and then the rest are solids because I really want just one fabric to stand out and I really just love the way solids look but so you don't have to if you're worried about trying to combine a bunch of prints together and they're just not working, then maybe sub out a couple of those prints for, like you mentioned, the blenders or the, the solid colors. Okay. And while we're talking about fabrics, I do want to say that um, cloth works 
uh, fabrics, mm -hmm. clothwork textiles, is the one who uh, gave us the fabrics to make both of our quilts. Yes. So um, be sure to, uh, the name of the collection that I used was Cassandra, mm -hmm. and they do have it on their website. That's, uh, so if you, if you can't get it, uh, or if I'm out of, out of the kits, you can check your local quilt shop and they might have it. Uh, but be sure uh, to, if you did buy the kit, when you post it on Facebook, please mention the fabric company because, um, because I have to thank them for giving us all this fabric to make these quilts. Absolutely, and a lot of times people want to know exactly what fabric we use. And I, I use, like I mentioned, I just used one uh, main print, and so mine was from Secret Garden, was the name of the collection, so, and then all of the solids were from American, American Made Brand. brand. And that those, their, their cloth works, Solid fabrics are made in America. They're mm -hmm. American-made brands, so um, we all all want to support things that are made in America. So remember that they do have their cottons made in America. Yep, and lovely colors, lots of yes, colors. Lots different. of colors. I had a hard time choosing. I think we went back and forth on the the perfect shade of blue to add to <laughs> to that quilt for probably weeks because there's so many to pick from. So they have tons to pick from. All right, our next one here would really like to make a navy and white quilt. Would windmills and pinwheels be a good pattern for a two-color quilt? Well, I mean, you can put the, make a two-color quilt out of any quilt uh, as long as you use different shades. Um, you can, uh, I think it would look pretty. I mean, I just love two-colored quilts. Uh, so you want to choose a really dark navy uh, and white, and then you want to get things in between. I don't tend to mix white and tans together. Um, just because th that's a personal thing of mine, but certainly you could put them in if you wanted to. And then you use different shades of blue from sky blue, you know, dark blue, you know, any uh, royal blue, you could put all those different kinds of blues in. Uh, so yeah, I think it would be okay. I mean, it, well, I was, I was more the word one this. that does solid. So. so I was gonna say, I'm gonna word this question differently then because our heads went in different directions. I'm gonna ask, is this a perfect pattern for a two fabric quilt? meaning only white and only blue. No other shades of blue, just two fabrics. That's what uh, I was thinking. Oh, okay. No, I wouldn't do it in just two fabrics because you have too many pieces that are gonna be together and you're not gonna see all the different triangles and all the different points that you're gonna get from this. So to use just two fabrics, a navy and a white, is would not work for this quilt. Right. I think in general, it's a good idea to use <laughs> as close, I mean, sub it, sub it out if you have to, but like as close to as many fabrics as are in the requirements, you know, if it calls for seven, use seven. If you have to use six and kind of fudge one somewhere, you can, but right. try and use as many. Otherwise, like you said, you're gonna lose some of the design element of the actual quilt. There's no reason to piece together two pieces of the same color right next to each other, unless, right. you know, you're gonna, right. you're gonna see it, it. It'll lose that design. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing is, is I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay, well, when it comes back around, um, we will catch back after that. But our next question here, Janice wants to know, why does cheap fabric not last as long? Well, fabric is printed on what's called gray goods. It's G-R-E-I-G-H. You would think it's not pronounced gray, but it is called gray goods. <laughs> and that's basically your muslin, okay, your muslin fabric. And you all, if you've been to a quilt shop, or Joann's or any other fabric shop, you know that there's different grades of muslin. There's muslin that has prints that, are, that has um, threads that, that are far apart, you know, and it has to do with thread count, how many th threads there are there in an inch. And the better quality fabrics have a closer, uh, have a larger thread count. Am I getting that backwards? Yes. Um, so in other words, the, the threads are closer together. Mm -hmm. And um, really good quilt shop fabric is, is printed on very good quality gray goods. The cheaper fabrics are printed on cheaper gray goods. Some of those are not color fast. Um, the good quality uh, fabric you'll find in the quilt shop are almost always color fast except for batiks, which because they're dyed, hand dyed, they're, um, they do bleed. Uh, so whatever you put in your quilt, if you want it to be uh, a, an heirloom, then you are going to want to use, pay a little extra, and you are going to want to use good quality fabric. 
If it's a, a cherry quilt, um, you can certainly use uh, something a little less expensive because you know it's going to be washed a lot, and you know. So um, I would uh, whatever you have to base it on whatever you're going to be making, uh, and the better quality fabric, the better it's going to stand up. I do a lecture where I show a quilt that I made that had two black fabrics in it, one that I bought in a cheap uh, cheap uh, outlet store, and one that I bought in a quilt shop and they were both black and they'd been sitting in a window and when I uh, when I show it at lectures I show that the quilt uh, the fabric that was bought in the chain store uh, faded it's gray but the fabric that black fabric that I bought in a quilt shop is still black so you get what you pay for mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I know that some people, a lot of people say, I mean, quilting can be sort of an expensive hobby because fabric can get expensive, especially if you're making large quilts. You have fabric, you have your rotary cutters, you have your rulers, you have all of this. But so if you're just getting into it, don't think that you have to, from your very first quilt, make it out of the top of the line fabric, especially if you're just practicing. Like I have lots of, we'll call it lesser quality fabric that I just use as my practice scraps, whether I want to practice a new block or practice just a fun quilting technique. So. If you're just starting out and just practicing, get some of that uh, cheaper fabric so you aren't, I don't want to say wasting money because you're obviously learning right. something, so it's not a waste of money, but you're not, you, you can save or you build your skills and then go get that really nice fabric and make something really, really nice. Right. And that's why I also tell people that before they make a block, do a test block mm -hmm. because you want to test your seam allowance, you want to test all kinds of things before. And so you aren't cutting into your good fabric uh, and finding out that you cut it wrong or whatever. So uh, make sure you make a test block. If you just make one test block when you first start out and, and it ends up being the right size, then you know the rest of them are going to be the right size. Right. But just make one test block. Use some fabric that are scraps or something that you bought uh, somewhere else. And then after you get that uh, down, then you can cut into your good fabric. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, Tawana says, what about using metallic looking fabric in a quilt? I'm designing a bedroom of silver and white and gray with the accents of pink and aqua. Would it be wow. okay to use metallic fabric or thread? Well, I mean, metallic thread uh, is, uh, when you quilt with it, uh, metallic thread, it, it does end up being real pretty, mm -hmm. uh, and it does stand out. I don't think it, it washes as nice. Um, it stands up as nice in the wash, uh, if it's not going to be washed that much. Metallic fabric, um, they make all kinds of different fabrics now, so, you know, it d depends on how heavy that metallic fabric is. Um, there are some lames, is it lames that are... Uh, a kind of metallic looking mm -hmm. um, that are very, they're more polyester, I guess, they're made of. And you certainly can put, there's no rule that you can't use a fabric in a quilt. I mean, crazy quilts are made with all kinds of different fabrics, velvets and sateens and cottons. and So you can put any kind of fabric in a quilt. You just have to think about how it's going to wear on a bed. Um, and if it's going to be washed or not washed. Um, so you have to look at instructions for those different kinds of fabrics to determine whether they would work well in a quilt. Yeah, and I'm just going to throw in this one random little tangent because it's like my only experience with metallic fabric, and this actually goes back to a previous project where we did some 12 days of paper piecing challenge on uh, National Quilter Circle Facebook page. So if you're not aware, we have social media that's not just for the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we have Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram as well. But on there, we did a challenge where it was Christmassy. So I had gotten from my local fabric store some fabric that had some metallic silver and gold, and I thought it would look really pretty on this quilt. And then as soon as I pressed my seams, that metallic all came off on the bottom of my iron. So make sure that if you are making you know, your metallic quilts, either use a Teflon pressing sheet, press with that fabric down so you're only pressing you know, the wrong side of the fabric, but just maybe test that out first because that was um, an unpleasant surprise. Right. right, and there are a lot of really beautiful fabrics that have metallic in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they aren't metallic fabrics, but there's a lot of fabrics that have gold or silver in them that would work just as well. Yes, absolutely. All right, next one here. Toby, how did you get started in quilting design? 
Well, um, uh, how long do we have? Well, <laughs> let's condense it just okay. a little They'll bit. condense it. Okay. okay. Um, I've sewn uh, since I was 11. My mother was a home ec teacher. So um, in the summer of 1985, uh, my mother and I took a quilting class from Jackie Robinson, who owned a local quilt shop in St. Louis. And I kind of got hooked on making quilts. Of course, I was making them from patterns at the time. And then uh, played with making quilts for my house. And then in uh, 1995, I worked in a quilt shop. And at that time, I started designing some of my own patterns and entering contests. So um, after that, I just got, started getting involved with magazines and fabric companies. And, and then the rest is you, history. And, and we brought you over to us. <laughs> and now we're getting you for all the challenges and all of your other videos and everything, it, it's patterns. Just, I love designing quilts. I think mm -hmm. it's just fun. And I love making my own designs. And um, when people like what I make, it makes me feel even better. Perfect. And I know you and I both use the, the same kind of software. So what do you use? To... I use Electric Quilt. Mm -hmm. And um, I love it. it. I can make any kind of quilt I want to make on it. And I can put the actual fabrics in it because I can get the actual fabric scans. And mm -hmm. it'll look exactly like uh, what I finish it as if I have to make it. So um, it's a wonderful quilt program. It's not that hard to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I just tell people if they do get it, they have to practice at least 10 minutes a day or they'll forget it all. I do agree with that. And I will just say if you are thinking, oh, I don't know what a computer generated image of a quilt would look like, those two images of the quilts that we keep showing you, those are actually the images that we created using EQ. So that's what they would look like if you're you're using EQ, you can print out and see exactly what your quilt's going to look like. Right. So, and, and adding I, in the appliques and everything. And I put a post, a picture of my finished quilt mm -hmm. in there and it looks exactly like that. Now yep. the teal might not look quite that same color, but uh, um, but it is the exact same fabrics. Yep, absolutely. All right, our next one here, it says, why do fabric companies cut jelly rolls with the fabric? They stretch when sewing together. I ruined a quilt this way. I used strips cut on the lengthwise grain and it turned out perfect. Okay, it depends on how you sew those strips together. Now, sometimes when you sew strips together, they tell you to um, alternate the directions that you're sewing in. And I would tend, if it, if it does stretch, I would tend to pin it. Because when you don't pin it, um, then they're all going to stretch and they're going to all be different sizes. So if you are sewing strips together and you're sewing a whole lot of them, uh, I was with a quilter at a retreat and she did that and didn't realize when she went to square up, I, I don't know, there might have been 10 strips. And she said she even alternated it. And when she went to cut those strips up, it was uh, really off. It was uh, very warped. And it's because she didn't pin the strip. And they'll one way, then the next row you're going to sew the opposite way. So um, it just works out better if you do that. Perfect. We have just a couple of comments in here that I wanted to say because Pat says that she loves your designs um, and Jane says that she loves your challenges. So I just wanted to well, let you know. Well, thank both you of very those. much. I, I'm, I appreciate that. It makes me feel good when people like what they're making. Absolutely. And so back to what we were just talking about with the cutting of the strips because loop it all back to the very beginning when we're talking about some of those abbreviations. Length of fabric and width of fabric are two things that get abbreviated a lot in quilt patterns as well. Mm -hmm. So what are those and what are they generally based off of? Okay, the width of the fabric is uh, the selvage edge to the selvage edge. Um, that's the that, uh, sewn edge of the fabric. And usually the width is uh, varies from 40 to 44 inches. Most fabrics about 42 inches. Um, and the length of the fabric is what's it's a, along the selvage edge. And the selvage edge, uh, that way the fabric stretches the least. And a lot of people like to make their borders cutting across the selvage edge because they don't want their borders to stretch. Um, and so a, a pattern will um, usually use a larger amount of fabric in the border because if you're cutting along the selvage edge, you need more fabric than if you were piecing those borders in, say, of, you know, four or five, uh, four inch or five inch strips. Um, so it depends on where you're using it. And I understand what that lady's saying. If it is cut along the other edge, the width of the fabric, it does have a little bit more stretch than the selvage edge. But like I said, you can, you can make adaptions so that it doesn't stretch as much. 
Perfect. So we're, we're about out of time, but I want to finish it off because we started off our live event talking about the challenge, so I want to finish it talking about the challenge. So if you have sort of one piece of advice or tip for somebody who is just starting out the windmills and pinwheels challenge, what would it be? It would be uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we're all here to answer your questions. The quilting community is so uh, generous. And everybody, well, of course, everybody's going to give you their own opinion, so you just have to pick which opinion you want. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just uh, take your time. This is not a rush. Those, the pattern's going to be up for a while, so all you have to do is go back. If you're a week behind, it's not a big deal. I've got people who are just starting to, are just finishing up the first uh, mystery quilt that I did back in Long November. Time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So, you know, just take your time and if you have a question, ask the community. Absolutely, because you know, there may be a bunch of different ways to do things too. So yes, different opinions, but also different methods and different ways to do things. So uh, between all of us, you're definitely gonna figure out how to put yours together. Right, so. and video, and uh, Ashley's gonna be doing videos. I mm -hmm. don't know if she did one already. Not but, yet, because I've been here. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm gonna be doing a blog, and uh, since I've been out of town, I, my blog will go up this evening. So mm -hmm. um, it'll explain the first part, and I'll give you some tips on how to do some things in that uh, first part. Yes, perfect. So of course, sign up for that challenge. Do that by entering in your email. Follow those steps like I, tips like I, steps like I showed you at the beginning. <laughs> there we go. Follow those steps like I showed you at the beginning. Uh, then of course, join the Facebook group page. And then of course, even when you're not participating in the challenge, follow us on social media, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. And of course, join us back here next month um, and we will have another live event. So I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye. <laughs>